In this video, we shall discuss certain preliminary concepts regarding the management of diarrhea. Diarrhea may be defined as the excessive loss of fluid and electrolytes in the stool. When it resolves within two weeks, we call it acute diarrhea. But if it persists beyond two weeks, we call it persistent diarrhea or chronic diarrhea. Now, what's the big deal about diarrhea? Well, diarrhea is responsible for 18% of death in children below the age of 5 years. Now, if we translate this into numbers, it works out to be 1.5 million deaths in children below the age of 5 annually and on a global scale. This makes diarrhea the second most important killer of children below the age of 5 years. Now in terms of incidence, it is estimated that around 2.5 billion episodes of diarrhea occur in children below the age of 5 annually in the developing world alone. Now, when we look at the incidence of diarrhea, little significant change has occurred in the past 20 to 30 years. However, there has been a significant fall in the mortality of diarrhea. For example, if we were to look at the number of deaths in children below the age of 5 years globally in the year 1980, the number was around 4.6 million. Now in the present day and age, we have managed to bring this down to less than 1.5 million. And although 1.5 million is indeed a grotesque number, I'm sure that the viewer would agree that this is a big step in the right direction. Now the reduction in mortality from 4.6 million to 1.5 million can largely be attributable to the introduction of ORS, oral rehydration salts. Now, ORS has been rightly described as potentially the most important medical advance of the 20th century simply because no other medical intervention has had the potential to save so many lives in such a short period of time and at such ridiculously low cost. Now in the 1970s, acute diarrhea was on a killing spree. Children died because of dehydration and efforts to rehydrate these children by giving them water to drink failed because the, the fluids or the liquid just couldn't be absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract. We needed to rehydrate them by giving them intravenous fluids. But unfortunately, this required trained medical personnel and this was not always possible. It was later discovered that adding glucose to salt and water enabled the fluid to be absorbed better from the gastrointestinal tract. It was very, very important that glucose, salt and water had to be mixed in the right proportions because if you don't get the proportions right, then the fluid and electrolytes would move in the opposite direction from the circulatory system into the lumen of the intestine and that would worsen the diarrhea, worsen the dehydration. So, the first large-scale use of ORS took place in 1971 in the Bangladeshi War of Independence Cholera broke out in the refugee camps and out of sheer desperation, mass use of ORS was implemented. Now out of 3,700 patients who were treated with ORS, 96% survived. Right. Now, what was it so special about this ORS that saved so many lives? Uh, so, to understand this, we need to understand firstly how fluids and electrolytes are normally absorbed from the small intestine. Secondly, we need to know how cholera toxin interferes with this process. And thirdly, we'll try to understand how ORS helps in the absorption of fluids and electrolytes from the gut in spite of the presence of the cholera toxin. Right. So let us assume that this is, a, is an enterocyte. Here is the K 
capillary lining the basolateral aspect and this is the lumen of the intestine on the luminal aspect. Now there are certain transporters and ion channels on the luminal aspect of this enterocyte that we need to be familiar with. They include firstly the chloride bicarbonate exchanger. This transporter is going to pump chloride ions from the lumen of the gut into the cell and it is going to pump bicarbonate ions in the opposite direction. So it's an exchanger or an antiporter. The next transporter that we need to consider on the luminal aspect of the enterocyte is the NHE or the sodium hydrogen exchanger. It pumps sodium ions from the lumen of the gut into the cell and it sends protons or H plus ions in the opposite direction. Thirdly, we need to consider a chloride channel called the CFTR channel. And it's going to allow chloride ions to escape from the enterocyte into the lumen of the gut. Finally, there is a transporter on the luminal aspect and it is called SGLT1. Unlike the transporters that we previously discussed, this is not an antiporter, it's a symporter, meaning it's going to send both solutes in the same direction. And in this case, it pumps both glucose and sodium from the lumen of the gut into the cell. Now it's very important to understand that this pump is not going to pump sodium from the lumen of the gut into the cell without glucose. It needs glucose to work. Both solutes are required for this particular transporter to work. Right. Now there is a transporter on the basolateral aspect of this cell and that's the sodium potassium ATPase pump. It pumps three sodium ions out of the cell and two potassium ions into the cell. So this is what should happen normally in an enterocyte that lines the small intestine. Now let us try to see what happens when this patient gets infected with cholera. Now Vibrio cholerae is going to elaborate a toxin called the cholera toxin. And it is composed of five B subunits and two A subunits. The B subunits are binding subunits and they bind to a particular receptor called the GM1 gangliocide receptor. This is a receptor which is seen in many cells in the body, including the enterocytes of the small intestine. This enables the A1 subunit to enter the cell and after a series of steps, it results in a persistently high level of cyclic AMP in the cell. Now this has got consequences on the chloride bicarbonate exchanger, the sodium hydrogen exchanger and the CFTR channel. Now a persistently high cyclic AMP level in the enterocyte is going to interfere in the normal functioning of chloride bicarbonate exchanger and it results in increased loss of chloride in the lumen of the gut and ultimately in the stools. Secondly, a persistently high cyclic AMP is going to interfere in the functioning of NHE and this is going to result in increased loss of sodium and therefore water in the gut and therefore in the stools. Thirdly, a persistently high level of cyclic AMP is going to increase the function of CFTR and that's going to cause an increased loss of chloride ions in the gut and therefore the stools. Now one thing that the cholera toxin does not affect is SGLT1 and therefore if we were to give this patient a solution where sodium chloride and glucose were mixed together along with certain other electrolytes in the right proportions, SGLT1 would ensure that sodium and water would be absorbed from the lumen of the gut into the enterocyte and with the help of sodium potassium ATPase pump on the basolateral aspect of the cell, sodium and water would be absorbed into the circulatory system. So this is how ORS works 
and this is how ORS helps to rehydrate a patient who is suffering from cholera. Right. Now it's important to understand that there is a completely different group of drugs called the SGLT2 inhibitors. These include the glyphlosins, uh, dapagliflozin, empagliflozin and so on. These are oral hypoglycemic agents. They have nothing to do with ORS. Right. It's important to understand that the function of glucose in ORS has nothing to do with providing energy or to provide calories. Glucose does not provide energy when it is given in the form of ORS. The only function of glucose is to make sure that the SGLT1 pump functions optimally to ensure that sodium is pumped from the lumen of the gut into the circulatory system where it belongs. Right. The use of this initial form of ORS helped save countless number of lives. However, it did not reduce the stool bulk. It did not reduce the duration of diarrhea either. So a search for a better form of ORS, which could do these functions as well, began. And attempts were made to reduce the osmolarity of ORS. And when the osmolarity was reduced, it resulted in a formulation that was as safe and as efficacious as the original form of ORS. And in addition, it was able to reduce the stool bulk as well. This is called low osmolarity ORS. And as of January 2004, this is the form of ORS that is now recommended uh, universally by the WHO and UNICEF. Right, so now we need to know the composition of low osmolarity ORS. We need to know this by heart. We also need to know the composition of ORS in terms of grams per liter and millimoles per liter. Now, when we talk about the composition of ORS in terms of grams per liter, we need to talk about the components in terms of sodium chloride, glucose, potassium chloride, and trisodium citrate. Now the amount of each of these would be 2.6, 13.5, 1.5 and lastly not exactly 2.6 rather 2.9. So if that helps you to remember, great. Now, in terms of millimoles per liter, we need to express the components in terms of sodium, chloride, glucose, potassium, and citrate. The amounts in terms of millimoles works out to be 75, 65, 75, and 2010. We need to learn this by heart. The total osmolarity of this low osmolar uh, ORS would be 245 millimoles per liter. Right. It's important to understand the purpose of inclusion of trisodium citrate in low osmolarity ORS. It's got three purposes. Firstly, the addition of trisodium citrate increases the stability of the formulation and therefore improves the shelf life. It prolongs the shelf life. Secondly, the addition of trisodium citrate reduces the stool bulk and therefore improves the efficacy of ORS. Thirdly, the citrate component helps to overcome acidosis, which is very common in, the, uh, in patients with dehydration. Right. So, low osmolarity ORS is recommended by the WHO and UNICEF in the treatment of dehydration due to acute diarrhea, irrespective of the age of the patient or the cause of the diarrhea. So, irrespective of age, irrespective of cause, ORS is the cornerstone in the treatment of diarrhea. Right. Now there is a related compound to ORS which we call Rizomal or Rizomal depending on how you want to pronounce it. 
So Rizomal is rehydration solution for malnutrition. It is a powder uh, for the preparation of oral rehydration solutions exclusively for oral or nasogastric administration. Uh, this is used for the rehydration of patients who are also suffering from severe and acute malnutrition. Now, unlike ORS, Rizomal should not be given freely to mothers or caregivers. It should be given by trained medical professionals in an inpatient setting. Right. So, let us consider this as a work in progress.